Welcome everyone. Thank you to all of you who are joining us live. Uh, welcome to the rest from across the world who will be watching the recording or listening to the podcast. It's a, a huge zechut to have Dr. Mark Shapiro back with us again. Welcome back. Um, first of all, the feedback we've been getting from the Chacham Ben Amozeg has, has Shiur has been tremendously positive and it's really sparked discussion on the on the on the WhatsApp groups and the discussion forums and I'm sure on many uh, Shabbat tables. Um, and I think we managed to get through all the material last week, so which has allowed us now to focus on, on a different uh, chacham, a different historical personality. Um, I think you, our, our listeners already know that um, part of our curriculum is, is to amplify Sephardi voices that from the past, uh, for one reason or another, are not being heard. I think especially in this case in, in, in Chutz Laaretz, um, because I believe there are initiatives in Israel trying to promote Rav Nisim's thoughts and, and writings. Um, I think I had a look and like, for example, Yad, Yad Harav Nisim Institute. Um, but nevertheless, it's an important figure that um, I think many of our members and even the wider learned Jewish public don't know much about. Uh, so it seems very appropriate. Um, and yeah, before I pass on the spotlight, as I mentioned to Dr. Shapiro before, we've had the grandson give us a chabura on, on the Sephardic liturgy, who works for Koren. Uh, I think Dr. Rabbi Meir Ben Ayahu, um, and he's a good friend of the Chabura, and so yeah, I just wanted to say that, and Mechavod, uh, thank you so much, and looking forward. Okay, uh, thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Oren, for that. Uh, just uh, a couple of things before we uh, start. Uh, glad to hear about the talk last week. I'm surprised I got a, that no one corrected me, although uh, I gave my Ashkenazic uh, background. Professor Gershon Bacon from bar Ilan University, who listened uh, on YouTube, he emailed me that I have to stop with the Ashkenazic. He's not Ben Amozig, he's Ben Amozig, as uh, you correctly just said. But what can I say? Uh, uh, my whole life he's pronounced it uh, that way, as, as we pronounce many other things incorrectly. Uh, I also want to call your attention uh, to this work. You can see Yalkut Romi, this is a Haggadah Shal Pesach in Perushe Chachmei Al Italia. And in it, because we talked about Italian sages last class, and it has uh, its uh, Likut of all the great Italian, or many of the great Italian sages, including uh, Ben Amoseg. So um, if you're looking for something uh, for the, uh, the Seder for, to study for Pesach, uh, this is something uh, you can uh, pick up. <clears throat> but today um, we are going to focus on. Uh, I think he was not from Italy, uh, Rabbi Yitzhak Nisim, uh, there is his uh, picture. Uh, his dates are 1895 to uh, 1981, and I'm just going to tell you, I think, the story of his life, why I think he's significant, some uh, interesting aspects of his uh, life. Uh, he's been very much overshadowed by Chacham Avadi Yosef uh, for understandable uh, reasons, but yet he still is someone who's deserving uh, of study uh, in his own right, uh, in his day, as we'll see, he was uh, quite influential and in certain circles, in Iraqi circles, he remains influential. So uh, let us begin. He, as I said, he's born in 1895 in Baghdad and um, this community in Iraq, uh, we might have Iraqis uh, with us now, uh, is an ancient community, um, nothing left of it really, although there are still some Jews left in Baghdad. There's, a, uh, there's someone in Brooklyn, um, who uh, comes from Baghdad and uh, her parents are still living there, but I don't believe there's even a Minyan on Shabbat anymore. Iraq is, of course, the land of the Geonim and of the Babylonian Talmud. Jews have Jews lived there since the destruction of the uh, second Beit HaMikdash, and it might be correct to say that until the 20th century, Jews had been living there in a continuous fashion longer than anywhere else in the world. Uh, there are always Jews in Eretz Israel, but you had a very, very tiny community. Uh, at, at times. So um, in terms of substantial communities, that might be correct, uh, that Iraq was the place. So in terms of Rav Nisim, we know that, um, as is often the case, uh, as a youth, he's different than others, but not just in terms of Torah study. He loved books. This is something that's special about him, and he collected them early on. This was the beginning of a great library, which contained thousands of books and manuscripts. Uh, if you go to Yadar of Nisim, you can see some of them uh, right now there. Uh, um, as a youth, he studied in, uh, there was a yeshiva in Baghdad called Beit Zilka. I think that's how you pronounce it, Zilka. Um, 
This was a yeshiva established in the 19th century by Rab Abdallah Somech. That's his name, Abdallah. Uh, just like in the Ashkenazic world, if you look in the Tosafot, there's a Rabbi Peter. Uh, you have non-Jewish names, and uh, that's how he's known as uh, Abdallah. And all the great Iraqi scholars studied there. In 1906, Rav Nisim's family went on Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael, but it's, it was tough then, economically it was tough. It was tough for a lot of reasons. And uh, it was a small community also compared to Baghdad. And uh, a few years later, Rav Nisim is back in Baghdad uh, where it's more conducive to his Torah studies. And as is always the case, with these figures, while still young, he's recognized as a great scholar, but he never becomes a rav, a rabbi, that is a practicing rabbi. His family tradition was that if you are a Torah scholar, you work for a living. That is, I'm not, not to say that rabbis don't work, but work outside of uh, the rabbanut. In fact, it was the general practice of scholars in Iraq to also uh, have a profession, well, they didn't have really professions, but to work in business, to support yourself. Uh, to combine Torah study with business. And like his father, he was a businessman, a merchant. And he imported materials from India and England. Remember, at the end of World War I, uh, Iraq becomes a British mandate. So it was very easy to uh, import and export to and from, from and to the uh, various other colonial territories. We know that he spent a lot of time in Basra and other places in Iraq. And of course, he spent a lot of time learning Torah. But we have to remember that, again, <clears throat> that here was a Talmud Chacham who most of the day, or large portions of the day, is working in areas other than Torah study. There was a time when, um, at least I speak here for in America, where Jews could not imagine a Gadol B'Torah, a great posseh, who didn't work as a Rav, as a, as a, as a rabbi. Now, by the way, people can't imagine, at least in America, a great Posek or Gadol, who does work as a Rav. If you look around, all the great Poskim, uh, how many of them are pulpit rabbis? You might have in England a couple of them like that, but if you look at the larger figures, go down the list. They're all Rosh Yeshiva or independent, uh, the whole idea which used to be standard. Before World War II, I can tell you in Europe, all the great uh, Gadolim, all the great, pos all the great Poskim, I should say, were communal Rabbani. Now uh, you hardly find it. Since Rav Nisim was working and making money, he was successful, he was able to buy books. Just like Ashkenazi Jews traditionally have not been interested until, until really until the modern year, until I think probably the last 30 years or so, Chacham Avad Yosef deserves the credit for this, but generally the Ashkenazi Rabbanim and Talmud Chachamim were not interested in books produced by the Sephardic Rabbanim with limited exceptions. The reverse was generally the case as well, with certain limited exceptions, books that sort of made it through, but classic books in the Sephardi canon, Rav Chaim Palachi from Izmir, uh, the Pantramoli, Petach Davir. you can go down the list. Uh, th these are just not uh, part of the Ashkenazic canon, and the same is for the, 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 in the reverse, but not for Rav Nisim. He's one of the few, maybe because he could afford to buy all these books, that he... Uh, he, he engaged both Ashkenazim and Sephardim. In fact, uh, he even wrote to the Chafetz Chaim, or Israel Mayor HaKohen, who I don't think most people in the Sephardic world uh, would have even heard of him. In 1924, he wrote to him asking for a um, haskama on uh, things he wrote. Uh, you can find this in his uh, volume of Teshuvot. Uh, it's uh, often mispronounced as... Uh, I don't know if you're seeing it correctly, I'm seeing it reversed, uh, but it's not Yayin Hatov, it's Yain Hatov, it's a pasuk in uh, Shir Hashirim. It's, uh, um, he asks, and the Chavitz Chaim writes to him that he really doesn't write uh, Haskamot, um, um, because he said if he would, then uh, everyone would be writing to him. Rav Nisim was also unusual in that he had very close relationships. When he returns, he returns to Eretz Yisrael, he had close relationships with a number of leading Ashkenazi rabbis, including Ratzi Pesach Frank, who was uh, the uh, chief rabbi of Jerusalem, the Ashkenazi. He also had a very special relationship with uh, this figure. Let me, um, hold on, let me pull him up on the screen. A, um, almost a, a mythical uh, figure here, hold on. His name is, um, His name as uh, Rev. Uh, Shlomo Eliezer Alfandari. Uh, 
lived over 100 years old, and uh, he's known as the Saba Kadisha. Many famous stories about him, and um, he was a poseik, and uh, I guess uh, people thought of him as a miracle worker, a saint. Uh, so uh, Rav Nisim had a very close uh, relationship with him. Towards the end of uh, Chief Rabbi uh, Ben Sion, Mayor Chai Uziel's life, he probably had clear classes on him, uh, he approached Rav Nisim, Ruziel was from, um, really reflected the, the Greek, Salonika type of uh, Judaism, but he approached Rav uh, Nisim and told him that he wanted Rav Nisim to be his successor, as a Rishon Nitzion. And uh, Rav Nisim had never held a rabbinic appointment. He was a merchant, but everyone knew he was a great Torah scholar and he had published on Torah matters. Uh, he was reluctant, but others, such as Chief Rabbi Herzog, and Ratsi Pesach Frank and Rev Maimon, they encouraged Rev Nisim to put forth his name for this position. And he, they had to create a system for the election of a chief rabbi of uh, the state of Israel. There had never been an election before. Uh, Rev Herzog was already elected chief rabbi for the Ashkenazim when it was Palestine. So this was to be the first election. There were a few minor candidates in opposition to uh, Rev uh, Nisim. But there was one major candidate, and his name was Yaakov Moshe Toledano. He um, had served also as minister, or he did serve as later as um, minister of religions. Um, but he went chief rabbi, as it says there, in Cairo and Alexandria. And at the time, he was chief rabbi of Tel Aviv. He's a great scholar. He's a, uh, a, a posseic. He wrote the Chuvot to Yam HaGadol, and he published much scholarship. Uh, very important figure of Vad Yosef refers to him positively all the time. Maybe really an important figure in the Sephardic world. And he did a lot to fight back against the discrimination against the Sephardim in the state of Israel. The problem is that uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, an individual named uh, Shlomo Hillel, the son of uh, Yaakov Moshe Hillel of, uh, of India, and then Gates Head, but now of Eretz Israel, a leading Mekubal, you can hear a Shirim on, on, on YouTube in English. Uh, his son is a Talmud Chacham, but also a great scholar. And his son published like a 350 page book claiming that the man I just showed you, the great Rav Yaakov Moshe Taladano, was a forger. And his writings are full of forgery. And that in addition to all the forgeries, he also uh, created from scratch this whole legend about uh, the, 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 the burial place of Ramosha Chaim Watsato that now everyone goes to for the Yeshuot and the prayers. He says that Toledano just invented it. And uh, this is just uh, broken a few weeks ago. And the implications of this are enormous because loads of scholars, especially those who dealt with uh, the settlement of Jews in, in, in Eretz Israel, in the Near East, Toledano published loads of documents. And um, just like Rav Nisim was interested in old documents and was a great scholar. But if it's upheld, and there's a lot of evidence that Toledano was a forger, it's, it's unbelievable to think about all the scholars who, <clears throat> who wrote works, and uh, now they're going to have to be retracted to the things they wrote. It's such a, such a crime on scholarship that I, I, I can't imagine how a Tamid Chacham and a Poseik and a respected figure could do something like that. And uh, it's good that it's a Sephardi rabbi attacking another Sephardi rabbi, so they don't blame uh, the Ashkenazim. But it's very unfortunate, and I always wanted to do classes on Rabbi Toledano because I'm a big fan of him. I lead summer tours. And uh, one of the play, and you're all invited to join my summer tours. Just go to the Torah in Motion website. But one of the tours I go to is Morocco, and the classic book on Morocco is uh, written by Rabbi Toledano, who was a rabbi in Tangier. So uh, this has been terrible. But but we'll, let's leave this to the aside. Uh, as Rav Nissim wins the election, can you imagine if Rav Toledano won the election? What we'd be saying? But he win, He 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 defeats Rabbi Toledano. The vote was forty-two to twenty-seven. And then he becomes a uh, Sephardi chief rabbi, known as Rishon Lezion. Uh, in 1959, Rav Herzog passes away. And then, so therefore, from 1955 to 1964, Rav Nisim is the only chief rabbi in Israel. He, uh, there's only one chief rabbi, because it, it took him a while to have the elections for the Ashkenazim. And then it was another English product uh, after Rav Herzog. Well, he's... Uh, United Kingdom, I guess you could say, from Ireland, but uh, Rav Unterman from Liverpool. When Rav Nisim becomes chief rabbi, and you can see this in the, in the newspapers of the times of the time in Israel, 
he immediately begins reaching out to all segments of the population, including the non-Orthodox. This was so significant that the Vatican newspaper, Asservatare Romano, if that's how you pronounce it, even stated that the Catholics can learn from Rav Nisim how to bring communists back to religion, because Israel had a lot of communists also that Rav Nisim was reaching out to them. He, would, he followed the path of Rav Kook. He went to the various secular kibbutzim. He, he really saw that as his goal, so much so that I found criticism of him because he was more interested in reaching out to the less religious, the secular, the not so connected. And some people thought that... Um, is the main job as a Rav should be involved in Psak with the, uh, the, the Orthodox population, but he saw himself as a Kalal Yisrael figure. So he's, um, he's I, I mean, it depends where, what your at, outlook is, but that's what he saw his major uh, uh, position should be. He also traveled around the world. Um, he went to Montreux, Switzerland, to where I have the letter from Rabbi Achiel Yaakov Weinberg, and Rabbi Weinberg describes him as a, a great and wise man, great in Hora'ah, that is in Pesach Alaha, in accord with the Sephardic approach, which I think the Chabura knows a bit about, uh, and as a gentleman, of course, with wonderful Midot. On his visit to Italy, well, he went to Livorno, I do trips to Italy also, and he arranged, Rav Nisim had this connection, almost like a mystical, perhaps, uh, well, I, I won't say mystical, but uh, he had a very strong connection, maybe because of the love of books and others, with the Chida, Rav Chaim Yosef David, David Azulai. From Rav Yosef Cairo, Maran, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, until Chacham Avad Yosef, the most significant Sephardic rabbinic figure was without question uh, Rav Chaim David Yosef, Chaim Yosef David Azulai, the Chida. In fact, he is the only figure after Maran, uh, Yosef Cairo, to be termed Maran, until you get to Chacham Avadi Yosef. Well, today everyone is called Maran, but uh, really, it's, you could say, Mi Yosef Ad Yosef, lo kam ke Yosef. You could say, Mi Yosef Yosef Cairo, Ad Yosef, Chaim Yosef, Tavon Ozadai, Ad Yosef, Chacham Avadi Yosef, lo kam ke Yosef. Uh, very significant figure in Psak, in, in, in uh, his commentaries, he, in his books. He wrote uh, a book uh, just describing the history of. Uh, Shem Agadolim, of the great rabbis and the great books. And he had lived in Livorno. He, he was in Pisa, but then he was in Livorno. He didn't serve as a rabbi. He, uh, he was supported, uh, but he didn't serve as a rabbi of the community. And he was, but he was regarded as the greatest of the figures. And you mentioned Ben Ayahu before. Rav Nisim's, um, Hanan Ben Ayahu's father is the scholar of Mayor ben, Professor Mayor Ben Ayahu, the son of uh, Rabbi Nisim. He wrote the classic two-volume work on, um, on the Chida. So why did he go to Livorno? He went there to convince the community to uh, move the, uh, the bones of the Chida to Eretz Israel, to Jerusalem. And he was successful in that. And uh, they were very impressed, of course, the chief rabbi comes and uh, he convinced them and they moved it and they buried him on Har Menuchot. And you can look in the newspapers, it was a huge um, uh, funeral where all the people, all the big people were there and spoke. Or, I'm not saying if it's true or not, but uh, he says it, that when he, he was involved in moving the bones and uh, he heard the bones moving in there. So uh, adding that uh, mystical angle there. Uh, and you can go now to Haram and and see it. Uh, I can tell you one other thing, though. When I went to Livorno, the, uh, the rabbi of Livorno, the former rabbi, they just got a new rabbi, the previous one, uh, Harav Didi. He told me it was a mistake and the community leaders realize it because uh, this was uh, in the early 60s, as I recall, not the late 50s, I think it was early 60s. Because now you have all these Hasidim, they go on these, uh, they call them Kavarim tours. They go just to visit the different graves and uh, the Chida is very well respected among the Hasidim. And uh, if he was still buried there, they would go there. They'd bring a lot of money into the community. Now, they're, they're, believe me, there are great Sadiqim and Chachamim, not just Ben Amozeg, but others in the cemetery in Livorno, but uh, the Hasidim haven't heard of them. But they have heard of the Chida. So the community, he told me, now regrets that they listened to these things. His visit to the United States uh, is famous. I know people who remember it. Uh, because in 1968, he came to YU, Yeshiva University, where he gave a shiur. And uh, Rav Soloveitchik said that this is the first time he had any personal contact uh, with a great Sephardic rabbi. Uh, he had Sephardim. There were Sephardim that he knew. There was even a couple that were in his shiur. But you know, one of the leading Sephardic rabbis, he even went so far as to say that in his youth, his best friend was the Rambam. 
Ramosha ben Maimun, because, you know, he, he grew up just with the Sepharim, uh, with the Sepharim. Uh, he didn't have uh, friends like we think of as little kids who were his friends. It was the Rambam, the Raivad, etc. And he never knew what the Rambam looked like, but he always imagined what he would have looked like. And now he knows, uh, he sees Rav Nisim and he thinks, oh, the Rambam must have looked like that. And Rav Nisim gave a shiur and uh, in it he called on the Rav, Rav Salavich, we call him the Rav in America, to make Aliyah which was so late, not only did he not make Aliyah, he never even visited uh, the state of Israel. He was in 1935, he was in Eretz Israel. In fact, he did more than this. He asked the student body, can any of you explain why you are not making Aliyah? And he then turned to the Rosh Yeshiva and Dr. Belkin, who was the president, and said the same thing, why are you not making Aliyah? He even suggested to them that none of these students should receive smicha until they go to study, at least, in Eretz Israel. Now many of them do. There's something called Grus, uh, Grus Kolo in Jerusalem, but in those days it was there wasn't such a program, and uh, very few of them did. When he went to Montreal, because he toured the entire America, he met with Rabbi Pinchas Hirschprung, great Talmud uh, Chacham in uh, Montreal, and Rabbi Hirschprung suggested that when he went back to New York, he has to go see the Lubav Cherebi because Rabbi Hirschprung was very close. Although Rabbi Hirschprung was not a Chabad Chassid, but he became very close to the Lubav Cherebi. Um, Rav Nisim said that he'll go visit the Rebbe only when the Rebbe um, would at least, if the Rebbe agrees to at least visit Israel. Just for one day even, to go to the Kotel, to Kotel, this is 68, the Kotel was liberated a year before and pray there and uh, um, give thanks to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that uh, he's given us back uh, the Kotel. And since the Rebbe won't agree to do this, uh, Rav Nisim says, I do not see a need for me to go visit him. That, that was his connection to Eretz Yisrael, and he thought that uh, those rabbis, even great ones like the Olav Cherebi, who didn't give proper due to Eretz Yisrael, he didn't feel like he had to give them proper due. He also went to Iran, and it was under his leadership that various takanot ordinances were made that improved the situation of uh, women in Iran. That is from a Jewish perspective. Uh, but the visit that catapulted the Rav Nisim onto the world stage wasn't his visit anywhere. Uh, the, the visit that uh, created also a god of controversy, it was the, the visit, the pilgrimage of Pope, Pope Paul uh, to Israel in uh, 1964. In 1964, East Jerusalem and Bethlehem were under uh, Jordanian control. But, but Nazareth and the Galilee, which are also important Christian sites um, with churches and uh, events in uh, Jesus's life, they say, uh, that's their tradition. Uh, um, so uh, any good uh, pope has to go to those places as well. The problem was that the Vatican did not recognize the state of Israel in 1964. They, they didn't recognize it, whether it's for theological. I, don't, I work at a Catholic university. I don't think by the 60s or even later, it wasn't until Pope John Paul II. It wasn't theological reasons by then. It was more of... Um, they were worried, uh, you know, they had good relations with the Arabs, you have Christians living in the Arab world, Maronites, for instance, are Catholic, and there's other Catholics living in the Arab world, but um, there's no diplomatic relations. This was also the era of Vatican II, however, where the Vatican, where the church took enormous steps to revise their theology so that Jews are not cast in such a bad light as they had been for so long. So the Israeli government didn't want to make trouble and uh, create a conflict. Uh, they decided not to fight with the Vatican, and uh, they agreed that um, they would go meet the Pope. That is, the Pope would come in, and uh, let's say he'd go to this monastery, and or the border, and they would go meet him. Rather than what's normally expected, that uh, you come, you visit a uh, country, you go visit uh, the, the people where they are. Uh, they're the host. And imagine everyone's surprised when Rav Nisim announces that he refuses to go meet the Pope. This achieved worldwide coverage, uh, and uh, the coverage in the news was Israeli chief rabbi refuses to meet the Pope. Rav Nissim said that I have no problem meeting the Pope, but it's there's a question of honor here, Jewish honor. And um, if the Pope refuses to come to Jerusalem, the Jewish side of Jerusalem, and refuses to visit the chief rabbi in his office as if the prime minister should also, he thought, not uh, go meet him. After all, the job of the visiting dignitary comes, they go visit the prime minister at the prime minister's office. You can meet them on the plane. They, that was also done. You meet dignitaries when they get off the plane, let's say, but then you have an official visit where they come visit you. And Rav Nissim said that um, I'm not going to go. He has to come uh, to me. And he said, it's not my kavod. It's the kavod of the Jewish people and of the Jewish religion. 
and of the state of Israel. And if the prime minister doesn't recognize that, then uh, that's their problem. Well, the pressure put on him was unbelievable. Uh, Golda Meir, the, who was foreign minister and was really responsible for the whole visit to the, uh, because the Vatican is a foreign country, uh, she was particularly enraged and she said, he's a government employee which he was, and therefore we tell him he has to go meet the Pope at the border, that was the plan. As he crosses in like from Bethlehem uh, into, the, into Israel, you have to go meet him. And uh, he has to follow what uh, they say. And uh, she wanted him to be fired. And Rav Nisim uh, refused, uh, despite the fact that numerous um, government leaders tried to convince him to back down, arguing probably correctly that this could backfire because Catholics around the world could see this as uh, an attack on the Pope, as uh, a Jewish leader attacking uh, Catholicism at the very moment that uh, Vatican II was doing such important things that would affect the relationship of Jews and Catholics. And there could be repercussions, elite anti-Semitism. Among those who wrote to Rav Nisim in this vein were uh, Salomon Gaon. I, at the time, I think he was at Spanish and Portuguese. He had not yet assumed the position in, in 64 as Chacham, uh, is that correct? He was not yet chacham in um, Spanish and Portuguese in, in, in your community, I don't think. Was he? And so, someone could check maybe while I'm speaking. I think in 64, he was not yet the chacham. He was at Spanish and Portuguese. He would become chacham of uh, London, but I don't think in 64 yet, uh, but I could be wrong on that. Uh, he was 49 to 95. He was officially, okay, but he was also working in um, in Spanish and Portuguese, I guess, for some of that time. Uh, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe he wasn't, uh, I thought he was, but I'll check that. Okay, so he was then the official Chacham, and he thought, and David de Solapur, who was also, actually David de Solapur was the Spanish and Portuguese at that time, uh, he, um, they both said, and I even saw the letter from de Solapur that, uh, that this was a terrible mistake, and uh, we're in the diaspora, we see the news, but Rav Nisim uh, refused uh, to back down. By the way, while I'm speaking, if some of you could also find out about this, Rev Salomon Gaon, because uh, unless I'm mistaken, I thought he also had position for a time while he was Chacham, also at Spanish and Portuguese in America. In the end, Shazar, uh, the president, Levi Eshko, the prime minister, Abba Ibn, and numerous others greeted the Pope, but not Rav Nisim. Let me speak a bit about some of his uh, halachic positions, which I think are interesting and significant. Oh, one more thing about this visit to the Pope. Uh, granted, it, it does reflect Jewish pride and the rabbis around the world were very pleased and they wrote about it. Was it a smart decision? I'm not gonna say it's smart. It could have been a terrible decision. It's very easy for the chief rabbi uh, in the land of in Israel to make a decision like that. But uh, if you have important rabbis in the diaspora telling him this is having a negative impact, uh, I think maybe that that's the more important consideration than that uh, I'm, I'm not gonna judge one way or the other, but it's uh, it, it's easy to say, it's a, it's a good example of Jewish pride, but uh, decisions like that need to be made with um, taking into account all the implications. Uh, so let me speak about some of the important halakhic decisions. Um, one of his most important Pesachim dealt with a group known as the B'nai Yisrael of India. Jews have lived in India, as mainstream right, Jews, regular Jews, um, within quotes, regular, uh, for hundreds of years, going back to at least Dutch rule in the 17th century. There was even Jews earlier in Goa in the 16th century. Uh, it was under Portuguese control, that is, uh, crypto Jews. Um, and in later years, there'd be an important community of Iraqi Jews, um, Baghdadis, they call them, uh, living in, um, in India. But there was also another community known as the B'nai Yisrael, uh, we don't know much about its history, different traditions as to how far back they go, what their origin is, uh, when they, uh, they, they, were, they were always kept separate, separate, so they have Jewish uh, background, it's, but uh, when they arrive there, is it from Antiochus, uh, is it uh, later, uh, it's a lot, a, lot, a lot has been written about it, and, uh, and their Judaism was very different than mainstream Judaism. They had very little in the ways of traditional prayers, but they had kashrut, Shabbat, and holidays, so presumably because they're not converts, uh, and it's not like Ethiopian Jews who could have been influenced by Yemenite Jews. Presumably, these they 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 lost much of their Judaism, but uh, when over the over the hundreds of years, but their authentic uh, original Jewish community. Uh, 
a few hundred years ago, they came into contact with other Jews and they began to come closer to uh, mainstream Judaism. And many of its uh, these B'nai Israel were prominent citizens. In 1937, one of the members of the B'nai Israel was the mayor in Bombay. But the Iraqi Jews refused to intermarry with them. I have a whole, if you go on my academia page, I have an article which I wrote about the position of the rabbis towards the, the B'nai Israel. And the Iraqi Jews are the most strict. Since the time they arrived in uh, India, they refused to intermarry with um, the B'nai Yisrael, even though other rabbis outside of uh, the Iraqi community uh, gave them their stamp of approval. This really didn't create big problems until the, the creation of the State of Israel, when the great Aliyah, who had B'nai Yisrael, who moved to uh, the State of Israel. Can they marry other Jews or not? Well, the chief rabbinate investigated and their decision was, well, first of all, they learned that there was no divorce among the B'nai Yisrael. So you don't have a question of Mam Zeirut. They just didn't have a divorce. Under Rav Nisim's leadership, the chief rabbinate ruled that it was permissible to marry with the B'nai Yisrael. This became a huge controversy because uh, there was a, you know, there were, it was a feeling of discrimination. The Jews uh, uh, in B'nai Yisrael were threatening they're going to go back to India where they're not discriminated against. There's no anti-Semitism in India. No Jew has ever been mistreated there. And uh, the, the feeling was that you're mistreating the B'nai Yisrael. Rav Nisim, they published a book, I have it over there, which is has all the halachic shuvot of the great Chachamim and the rabbis, as well as the historical record. Uh, and that has been the psak since, that the B'nai Yisrael are just like all other Jews, and um, uh, you can marry them, and they're part of our kehillah. We mentioned a few other interesting uh, teshuvot of Rav Nisim. You find these teshuvot in his sefer, the Yen uh, uh, Hatov. So, for instance, it's not going to be that much longer, and we're going to have uh, Yom Ma'ot. And the question is, at least in America, I don't know what the, the London Bethden's position is, and I don't know what uh, the your Bethden, the Sardic Bethden is, but uh, Yom Ma'ot uh, comes out during the Sefira. So can you have weddings during that time? Uh, can you uh, get a haircut to all that? Um, the uh, Rav Nisim was asked about this, and uh, he says that uh, Yom Ma'ot is a commemorates a miracle that occurred during Sphira, and therefore you can get married and you can cut your hair. And some one of you can type in there, tell me what the uh, the bait in of the uh, of the Spanish and Portuguese, and if you know the London bait in what they position is on this. But this was Rav Nisim's position that Yomat's mode is a significant day, and Sephira, that's a minhag, and uh, it certainly can be pushed aside uh, for something as important as Yomat's mode. He says. When it comes to Yom Ma'ut, our hope was that the political revival would also lead to a spiritual re revival and that the state of Israel would be based completely on Torah ideas. He says, we haven't merited this. We're in a much better situation now than um, you know, 40 years ago. But uh, he says, although we have not merited this, this doesn't darken our joy at the great political revival. Uh, because that which is lacking will over time be replaced and God will uh, give us a full redemption in the future. But right now we have to give thanks for the partial redemption, that is the physical redemption. The spiritual redemption will come, but now we have a, uh, a physical redemption. In the years after the war, there was a lot of discussion what to do about Germany. What to, some people didn't want to travel there. Uh, there should be a boycott of German goods. He was asked if Germany has the status of Amalek. There were people who said that. Um, and he says that we cannot apply the mitzvah of Amalek to any other nation. That um, there's Amalek and that's special. We don't apply it because if you say there's Amalek, then you judge the children by what the sins of their fathers, all sorts of things we don't want to go to. Unfortunately, in uh, certain parts of the Haredi world, they're talking about the Ukraine as if contemporary Ukrainians, you know, they uh, they're bear the sin of Kalmanitsky and bear the sin of what happened during the Shoah when uh, many Ukrainians were collaborators. Uh, Rav Nisim has a completely different perspective of that. Now he does mention that according to Rav Chaim Salvechik, it's famous, Rav Chaim Brisker is said to have commented that the law of Amalek applies to any nation that, this, that wants to destroy the Jewish people. But Rav Nisim rejects this. He says there's no source for this. And um, it's uh, really Rav, Rav Chaim was also not speaking in, in a halachic sense, that that means that the children and all that are to be treated like Amalek. But Rav Nisim, um, he, uh, he rejects the idea. And in the midst of his teshuva, he deals with how Jews should relate to Germany. And he discusses the supposed cherem 
of the, supposedly when the Jews were expelled from Spain, they issued a cheyrim, my very first, uh, on Spain, my very first scholarly article written when I was in college. I sort of am upset I wrote it then because uh, it reads like a college paper and I've written it today, it would be much better, but uh, was on the cheyrim on Spain, history and halacha. This is a legend. It's not true, but many Jews in the Ashkenazic world, not the Sephardic world, had this notion that there was a cheyrim about uh, returning to Spain. And he mentions there that no, there's no such concept. There's no issue of uh, returning to Spain. If that was the case, then uh, Avi, you'd have a problem there because I assume uh, your family, I don't know when, if you're from the original Moroccans who came into Spain or not, but uh, the, as soon as the Spanish were, um, um, well, I guess Gibraltar is not Spanish territory anymore, but then the, by the late 19th century, Jews from Morocco were coming in. Uh, you know, when Morocco, when England made a, the United Kingdom made a, uh, a treaty with Spain to get Morocco, to get Gibraltar, the, 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 their deal, the deal was that uh, Britain would not allow any Jews into Gibraltar, and they quickly uh, violated that, uh, that aspect of the treaty, uh, and uh, not like Spain could do anything about it. There's a relatively new book that appeared. Unfortunately, it's very heavy. They make these farim now, which are so heavy, it's uh, because the, the, this, the cover is enormously heavy. But it's called Nachalat Avot. And what is Nachalat Avot? And look how thick it is. It's materials that comes from the Sassoon family. Sassoon family of India, which then makes its way to England. They were in Letchworth and in London. So they had many manuscripts. They were big collectors. But much of this book is Torah correspondence between the great rabbis, including Rav Nisim, and members of uh, the Sassoon uh, family. And that doesn't surprise us. The Sassoons were Tamidi Chachamim. They were business people, but they were also Tamidi Chachamim. Uh, all the Sassoons. Uh, Salomon David Sassoon, uh, who's passed away um, about uh, 40 years ago, I guess, or 35 years ago, he was even suggested to be chief rabbi. Uh, but what might surprise you, or might not, uh, is that there are questions today, let's put it this way. Today, we all know learned women. You have learned women in England, you have learned women in America, you have learned women in Israel, you have uh, lots of schools in Israel for the women. Before it was fashionable, before there were women Torah scholars, there was a woman named Flora Sassoon. She was an authentic Torah scholar, the greatest female Torah scholar of her time, uh, I think I can say. And uh, she died in 1936. She was an incredible woman. Um, from 1901, she lives in England. Wherever she traveled, she brought a shochet and a minyan uh, with her. She was a we can say a Talmida Chacham. Uh, she knew Shas and Poskim. I'm not saying she knew it be Iyun, but she studied it uh, uh, in Rabbi Yoel Herzog. That's Rabbi Yitzhak Herzog's father's uh, work, Imre Yoel. He was a rabbi in Leeds before he went to Paris. There's even a drasha of hers that was given to the students at Jews College, what was called Jews College. And there are many letters to her not just from Anissim, from Ashmuel Yitzhak Hillman, who was the Abbatin of London, from the rabbis in Baghdad, from the, not the Ben Yishchai, although she corresponded, but from the Ben Yishchai's son, many letters, and, and also from Rav Nisim. In fact, in letter number 22, uh, uh, we see from Rav Nisim's letter to her that she didn't want him to quote her by name. She thought it wasn't Sniot, uh because he, he, he would publish his letters in Torah journals and who he sent them to, and she didn't want that, and uh, he disagrees. This is on page uh, 209. He says to her, uh, and because the, the Ben Yishchai already would answer questions to her, and uh, other big rabbani, and uh, she says that, uh, he says to her, um, that no, that I spoke to the rabbis in, in um, in Baghdad because they were upset that uh, I would uh, correspond with you. And they didn't think that I, well, they didn't say that. He said that, um, uh, he says, when I printed the tshuva to you in a Torah journal, uh, there were those rabbis in Baghdad who didn't think, yeah, didn't think that I should correspond with you in Torah matters because uh, what does, a, you know, the Chazal tell us, they say that, uh, well, what does a woman have to do with Torah Shabbat? And um, 
he explains to them, he says as follows, I wrote them a long teshuvah that women who, um, who, who uh, devote themselves any woman who devotes herself to Torah study, Torah Shabbat Peh, we're talking about Talmud. It's an obligation on the leaders, the Torah scholars, to strengthen them. And uh, he says, after they heard what I wrote, they were satisfied with that. Um, and he says, I'm going to publish the Teshuvah I wrote you. And I will write that the, um, because the she, 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 she also, she didn't want it. She says that uh, uh, she does not want him to put her name in, and he put her name in anyway, and then the rabbis in Baghdad were upset, and he uh, convinced them otherwise, but now he turns to her that you didn't also, for reasons or whatever, he says, he says I don't know why uh, you didn't want me to write your name. He, I, I assume it's Snute reasons, uh, but he says to her that um, that you are harabanit hayichida sheamada acharei harabaniot shehiskir rabenu hachida b'shem hagdolim b'marechad rabanit. What is he referring to here? He says that you are the first. What, what does the word rabanit mean? First of all, rabanit does not mean rebetzin. Uh, well, the chida has a book, Shem Hagadolim, which has all the great rabbis. He lists all the great rabbis uh, over history. And then he has a section in this book. It's a little section, but it's a section there. You can look it up called Rabbanit. And when the Chida says Rabbanit, he does not mean Rebetzin. Rabbanit means female rabbi. Rabbi, what's a female rabbi? One who has great Torah learning. She's a rabbi. You say she didn't get smicha. Well, you know what? Uh, Rambam didn't have smicha either. And uh, they didn't have such a thing. This is an Ashkenazic innovation. Uh, this uh, Rambam didn't have smicha either. Uh, rabbi means you're uh, a great scholar. And he says to her that you, for Sassoon, are the greatest rabbanit since, uh, since the Chida, that is the greatest woman Torah scholar since the Chida in his book uh, included this section there of uh, dealing with rabbanits. Uh, uh, he deals with the medieval uh, women who are mentioned that they asked the question. And in for Sassoon, uh, she's greater than them, I have to say. You know, you have the Truma Tadesh and others who mentions a, a, a kushia of a woman, so he, he mentions it in Rabbanit. But for Sassoon is learning Torah every day and she's corresponding on Torah matters with the Gedolei Yisrael. Now, granted, some of the questions uh, today we won't have, we have the art scroll, so we don't need. I mean, she's learning Gemara and he has a question, what does this word mean? So she writes to the rabbi or she writes to one of the rabbis and asks, where, does, uh, where in the Talmud uh, does this uh, discussion appear? I see references to it, but I don't know where. Today we have concordances, we have on the line, you know, we search for it. But in those days, you had to go to the walking concordances. Here, but she's a woman who's studying all these matters. And he says to her, listen to this, uh, and he says, I have to publish your name. You, who was the only Harabanit Yechida, the only Rabbanit since the Chida's day. Why? He says, because Kinat Sofrim will increase wisdom. Other women will see that you are a woman and you're a Torah scholar. He's saying, God will you know, put it in the hearts of women. In other words, he sees this as a positive thing, that women around the world will see that there is this woman, this is in the 20s, in the 30s, for a Sassoon, and uh, she's sitting there and she's studying Torah, so all women, he's not looking at it like the Chavetz Chaim looked at it, like, oh, woe is us that we're in a generation today where women are getting secular educations, and uh, we can't have a situation where they have advanced secular educations and they have no Jewish education. That's a bizayom to the Torah. And also to, you can't create religious women if uh, you keep them ignorant uh, when they are becoming learned in secular matters. No, the, uh, that's the Chavis Chaim's perspective. That's the Beis Yaakov perspective. Rav Nisim is saying differently. He's saying that uh, this is a, a positive thing. Women will see this and they'll also want to study because I'll say if she can become a great Torah scholar, then I can become a Torah scholar also. And these women will become Torah scholars, or Torah students, perhaps is better to say, and they'll have a positive influence on their households. Um, and he goes on and on. So I, uh, quite, uh, quite significant, I think. Uh, um, okay, let me go on. Uh, uh, we still have some time. Um, with regard to women, let me mention another teshuva in Yen Hatov, uh, volume two, number six. 
he says that uh, when a girl becomes bat mitzvah, you should make the beracha, baruch, uh, you know, the blessing of uh, that, uh, that uh, I'm free from this uh, burden. Do you, do you have, does Svardim say that, bracha? Shepetarani, do you say that in the Sephardic world? When your son is bar mitzvah, is there a blessing? The Ashkenazim have a special blessing. You're looking at me like uh, I'm from the moon here. But the Ashkenazim have a special blessing because it's uh, it's said uh, that, uh, you know, when the child's young, that your responsibility is on the parent. And uh, if the child sins, you 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 have the responsibility on it. So uh, therefore, we, uh, we, uh, we're, we give up that responsibility. The person is an adult uh, in the Torah sense. Uh, and he says that the girl, uh, you should make that baracha. So in Iraq, they must have said it. And this is a post talmudic baracha. So there's a problem about saying God's name. Uh, but that's also a problem with regard to boys. There's different minhagim. Uh, uh, and, he, and unless there's a minhag to say God's name, which in this case there isn't, he says you shouldn't um, for boys or for girls. He continues by saying that on the day that the, of her bat mitzvah, she should rejoice because she's obligated in mitzvot. Just like the boys do, and he quotes a Sephardic Rav named uh, Avram Musafia, who was a 19th century scholar. He had a manuscript to Shuva of his in which he says that when a girl turns 12, it's proper to have a meal in honor of the day. It's a Sudat Mitzvah, just like with the boys, the Beni Shchai speaks about. In, other words, in the Sephardic world, they didn't have these issues that the Ashkenazic world had where uh, you have reform. So anything you do, then all of a sudden they're going to say, well, you're reformed, you're conservative, uh, even if it has a good reason. For people like Rav Nisim, it's a simple thing. It, uh, why shouldn't the girl have a celebration? Uh, she's obligated in mitzvot. Uh, and they don't have to worry in the Sephardic world, uh, looking over their shoulders, oh, the conservative, the reform, uh, that, that's really not an issue for them. Uh, he quotes the Beni Shai that uh, there is no, uh, we, we don't call it a sudat mitzvah, but the girl should be happy on this day and uh, wear new clothes and make a shechianu. The Ben Yishchai also says that there are those who celebrate it every year and celebrate the birthday every year and make it a Yom Tov, and that this is a good thing. And he says it was the practice in his house as well. One of the reasons why Chacham Ovadi Yosef put forth his candidacy to be chief rabbi, Rishon Tzion, is because Rav Nisim had pushed for the creation of a special Beit Din in a controversial matter of Mamzerut called the Langer case, which involved Rav Goran. I don't want to get into it. It would take us a while to deal with this, but it was a very controversial case dealing with Mamzerut, where Rav Goren uh, charted his own path and uh, into opposition to Dayanim and the Beit Din Haggadol, and um, um, Rav Nisim, um, he, um, he supported, not necessarily the, res the, the conclusion, but the, res but the approach that Rav Goren said that we have to look at it again, examine this and see what we can come up with. And in general, the Haredim were not happy with Rav Nisim. They thought he was too open-minded, too liberal, that he put his focus on Klal Yisrael as opposed to focusing what they thought more on, uh, on the, uh, the Orthodox community. And they were alienated. And um, Rav Nisim in the election they had made an alliance with Rav Goren. And there are all sorts of political intrigues. And the whole concept is unusual. Since when do you kick out a rabbi? If he retires, it's one thing, but you're going to have a rabbi who's uh, the posek for your community, who's your rav, and you're just going to, now in America, we do do that. But traditionally, that wasn't done. And traditionally, uh, you pick a rabbi, and if he's fine, you don't uh, then have a vote after 10 years <laughs> to get rid of him. He stays till he uh, can't do it anymore. And it's, it's in a sense, you can see it as a great bizayon. Rav Chacham Avad Yosef in Yabiya Omer, he has a teshuva in volume nine, Choshen Mishpat number nine, explaining why he was permitted in this case uh, to run against Rav Nisim. And his argument is that uh, many of the Dayanim uh, were opposed to Rav Goren and Rav Nisim was together now with Rav Goren. So therefore he explains why he thought it was acceptable. And he was able to get the support of a number of political figures and some influential Sephardic figures as well. The Babasali came out in favor of uh, Chacham Avadia. And after having served 17 years, Rav Nisim was voted out and Chacham Avad Yosef was voted in. Uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe was very opposed to all this. He said that we do not vote rabbis out. There's no such concept, but uh, others had a, a different uh, perspective. And uh, I have to add though, that Rav Nisim's side would get its revenge because Rav Nisim's son is named Moshe Nisim, his two sons. 
and Moshe Nisim. He didn't change his name. The other son changed the name to Benayahu. Benayahu was, uh, there's a connection to the Ben Yishchai. He has a book, Benayahu. I don't know the details of why they changed the name, why he thought uh, that name in particular, but the Moshe Nisim was Minister of Justice from 1980 to 1986. And uh, he made sure that the law, because there was supposed to be 10 years, every 10 years you're supposed to be elected, I think, or uh, re-elected. Um, or 15 years, whatever. No, I think it was 10 years. He, he was elected for five years, Chacham Avad Yosef, and then they extended it, something like that, for another for 10 years. But there was, um, there was many people pushing to just allow Chacham Avad Yosef. He was the greatest Torah sage. Uh, yeah, he's going to go for, for another election. No, the attitude was just change the law, let him remain as uh, chief rabbi. But Moshe Nisim was the minister of justice. And he remembered what Chacham Avad Yosef did to his father by kicking him out. And uh, he refused he, to, uh, he made sure that the law was not changed. And that allowed for Mordechai Eliyahu. Mordechai Eliyahu was very close to Rav Nisim, who follows in Rav Nisim's path to be elected chief rabbi. Really, the issue was also between the Iraqis. I don't know if, how many of you know about this, but Chacham Abad Yosef basically burnt his bridges with the Iraqi community that he comes from because uh, he rejected, in terms of he rejected the Ben Ishchai and said, you have to adopt the Shulchan Aruch. Rav Nisim and Rav Mordechaiahu followed the old Iraqi approach, which means that we don't reject our practices from the Ben Ishchai. We continue our minhagim. So if you go to Israel today, many people in the Iraqi community do not actually follow the Pesachim of Chacham Avad Yosef because they see him as have depart having departed from the um, Iraqi tradition. And maybe if I come back, I'll speak about, uh, you can hear about Chacham Avad Yosef. Things became so controversial that the Iraqis even burnt one of Chacham Avad Yosef's first books because they thought he was, it, it's, it's very bad if you come from the community and then you reject the standards of the community, but that's for a different day. And then, so from that time, uh, from the early 1970s, uh, Rav Nissim was no longer uh, chief rabbi. So maybe it's better the best because he spent the rest of his life till 1981, what we hope rabbis should be doing, uh, focusing on Torah study. He founded a yeshiva, more like a rabbinical training institute uh, where you can go there today, Yad HaRav Nissim and uh, uh, they have a koel there, and they publish Rav Nisim's uh, writings. Uh, they've come out with uh, many volumes uh, of Torah works, not related to Rav Nisim, just in general, but then they, they, they reprinted the Teshuvot and also the small Teshuvot. Yen HaTov is the large volumes, but you have, uh, they came out, it's called Liklal Ulifrat. Rav Nisim also had to write lots of small letters, like someone writes some, some, some just regular individual writes him a question, and Rav Nisim, one paragraph answer, or maybe three page answers, but uh, so these are smaller tissue vote. I think there's four volumes or five volumes now. You learn a lot because Sephardim from all over the world, uh, you have letters to him from everywhere, from Singapore, from Burma, from Brazil. You really get a sense of what the Jewish world was going through, and not just Sephardim, but uh, in particular Sephardim. So these are um, of great interest. And if you're interested in his archive, it, it has now been put online. Um, the Israel State Archives, you can go and you can see the correspondence, the letters coming in and the letters going out. Uh, it's a great family. There's uh, Professor Benayahu, one of the outstanding scholars of uh, Jewish history in all of its areas, rabbinic history of the last uh, 500 years, Italy and uh, Spain and the Middle East and Morocco. Uh, and he got this from uh, his father, the great Rav Yitzhak Nisim. So uh, I'm looking at the clock and I've, I've gone on long enough. So let me uh, take some of the questions and uh, comments. Um, and thank you all for coming out today. So Chacham, it says, yes, uh, Solomon Gaon was in the post from 49 to 77 at YU from 76, but uh, that wasn't, I, I, I think for a time, and uh, I have to look into this now, that before rabbis in the Spanish and Portuguese, he also served as a uh, rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. That is, he'd come in uh, every, um, I don't know how often I did it. Well, let me see quickly. I'll see. Uh, uh, yeah, I just, I, I just looking right now, I'm looking online in the, the Wikipedia. He was connected to Spanish and Portuguese. Um, it's not clear what that connection is. I have to ask, I, I know the rabbi of the Spanish and Portuguese. So uh, 
he um he was um this was after he left though uh, after he left uh london uh, okay um freddie says that some sephardim don't mourn at all during the omer that's news to me i know the yemenites don't what other sephardic communities does not do not uh, take into account the omer yemenites don't uh so, you know, you say Nahar Mitzrayim writes that when you went to Egypt, they would have weddings. But um, does that mean that they also uh, cut their hair or anything? Because you can make a case that a wedding, see, a wedding is a mitzvah. So you can make a case that you can have the wedding. Chacham Bavad Yosef was lenient on weddings for soldiers who were going to go in the army. Our tradition is not, at least in the Ashkenazic world, is you don't have weddings, but I see how you can make the you can push it if you want. Some some rabbis have said that uh, a wedding is about prut or vu. We don't push off prut or vu because of a minhag like uh, svira. But when you say they don't do svira at all, are you saying that they will, they'll cut their hair also, and that they'll play music, live music? They'll have an event where you'll have live music. The Yemenites know nothing about this practice, which is a medieval uh, Ashkenazic thing. Uh, Okay, yes, thank you. Salman uh, Sassoon, 1985. His son lives in America. Also, they have son in, in Israel. Um, and Freddie says, not all Sephardim celebrate bar mitzvah, some don't at all. Oh, I didn't know that Rav Nisim's Teshuvot are now online. Simon says that the story goes that after the election, Moshe Nisim visited his father's grave to tell him he had avenged him. Uh, there is no love lost between Rav Avad Yosef and Rav Nisim. Rav Avad Yosef publish. He has a diary which Sexism published and he has to shoot where uh, he lets his feelings known about uh, Rav Nisim. Chacham Levad Yosef quotes everyone and yet uh, you'll see that he often does not quote uh, Rav Nisim and at first the relationship between them was very good and uh, Rav Levad Yosef even taught you know Rav Nisim asked him to teach places but because of the conflict over the Ben Ishai, especially in particular because of that uh, and other things as well, uh, it was not a, a good uh, relationship. Uh, I think he wrote somewhere that they used to be good friends, but after he came back from, from Cairo to Israel, <laughs> yeah, from their side, they'll say that uh, Rav Nisim uh, was jealous of uh, Chacham Avad Yosef because he became very popular. He had a very good connection to the young generation and uh, the masses. Uh, from Rav Nisim's perspective, they will say that um, um, that he didn't, Rav Chacham Avad Yosef did not show proper respect uh, to um, him and that, uh, and that he tried to create his own um, base of power, it was a, it was a machoket. And uh, the Iraqi community uh, lined up with Rav Nisim, including Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, because uh, this, they thought that Rav Chacham Rav Yosef was trying to, if he was a nobody, it wouldn't be important, but he was so influential and he's teaching classes and he's teaching Iraqis not to follow the Ben Ishchai, which for them, it's uh, that that's the Shulchan Aruch. And, uh, he was saying that now we are in Eretz Israel, we have to follow uh, Maran, Rav Yosef Cairo's position, and that's uh, going against the Minhag. Uh, Rav Kaduri was also opposed to Chacham Avad Yosef uh, at this time. So it was it a was difficult period. And yes, Rachel says, I know, I, mean, I don't know the details, but I know that, uh, that uh, Chacham Gaon's departure was uh, not, not so simple and there was uh, uh, problems there. And I do not believe uh, that after he left, they did not appoint a Chacham, if I'm not mistaken. I think Rabbi Toledano was not a Chacham. Is Rabbi Dweck a Chacham? Or is he considered a Chacham? Okay. Um, okay, I, I, I see we've already gone to 4.30, my time. Uh, I'm very happy to be back and a uh, smaller group, and uh, but a uh, great group as always, uh, for the two times I'm here. And uh, uh, look forward and uh, take it away, Avi. Thank you, thank you so, so much for another wonderful class. Uh, you, you're so thorough that it's difficult to come up with good questions because it cover everything. Um, and as, as Matthew said, there's Teshuvot available on Safari and I'm sure all of us will be looking more into Rabbi uh, Tzach Nisim. Um, I don't really have any announcements except- By the way, the Teshuvot is only the Yen Hatov. Yen Hatov. Oh, yeah. uh, the book of the uh, Sassoons, it's called um, this one, uh, Nachalat Avot. And, They're coming uh, out with the second edition of Nachalat Avot now, actually. Oh, with more material in it? Yeah. 
Okay, well, this this is great. This has such good stuff in it. Uh, but uh, the stuff, to, it would have been worth it just to see the letters of these Gedoli Yisrael to Flora Sassoon, that they would have a correspondence. And they didn't think it was unsnyut to engage in correspondence, Torah correspondence with a woman. And then for the letter of Rav Nisim saying that uh, we need to publicize you because uh, then other women will see that they too can become uh, learned in Torah. Remember, he's just coming from the Sephardic world where people like to imagine it incorrectly, but they like to imagine it that the women, you know, uh, maybe in certain places in the Sephardic world, which had in the Ashkenazic world also, where the only purpose for the woman is to get married young and have lots of children. And uh, Rav Nisim has such a different approach. He was, he was, he was an enlightened thinker. I remember I, I knew someone, uh, he passed away, but uh, the name is Dr. David Lando, who knew Rav Nisim personally. And he, the way he described him as like a, a Sephardic gentleman. And uh, he said he couldn't, he, he said he couldn't handle certain religious uh, personalities. Let's put it that way, uh, because uh, he thought that they, they were not dignified. And, uh, you know, sometimes all we think about in terms of rabbis is we think about Torah knowledge, but the rabbi has to carry himself with dignity and uh Rav Nissim was such, was such a person so thank you all yeah um and we were talking about the predecessors or, or um of, of the Spanish Portuguese uh leaders uh, we have on Wednesday uh Rabbi Abraham Levy in conversation with with Rabbi Dweck um so we look forward to to seeing everyone there um I think they'll be talking about um M Moses Montefiore um, and yes, just a reminder of the Pesach book, um, to order our new book, and thank you everyone for, for joining us, and um, we look forward to having you again, definitely soon, um, and thank you for everything. That Sorry, doing. just Avi, is it possible I could just uh, make one final observation that might be of interest to, to, to Rabbi Shapiro? I have the, a book, oh, I just was ran down to the bookshelf to get it, that was written, was compiled by... Uh, I think by his children, Rav um, Suleiman David Sasson wrote. I don't know if you've seen this. So yes, uh, it's a um, it's a commentary on, uh, on Talmud and Chumash and other things. Is that what you're referring to? I think so. Yeah, it's called Natan Hochma Lishlomo. Lishlomo, yes. Yes, yes, I know that work, and uh, I've actually referred to it on a number of occasions because uh, he has something in there about uh, Torah, the Torah Misenai which is of ever great interest. Uh, so I know that and it, work. Yes. And it also has a transcript of Flora Sassoon's... Um, she, yes, she, yes. She the presented, she, That's right. Yes. That's, and it says there, if I'm not mistaken, it delivered at Jews College, right? That's correct, yes. yes. The, the, the actual transcript of her, of her drasha to the, uh, to the rabbis who received smicha that year was given by her. And I think it's, it's in, interestingly, it's in the book. Yes, and as I said, Rabbi Yoel Herzog, in his book, Trashot, he includes it there, so you can see the, the Hebrew. Uh, she was corresponding in Hebrew with all these rabbis. Uh, mm. And Rabbi Hillman, Rabbi Hillman was the Av Beitin of London, for the other, the other Jews in London, uh, before Rabbi Chesko Bramsky, and he is Rav Herzog's father-in-law. Um, and uh, by the way, Rabbi Dessler, he taught, um, he taught the Sassoons. Uh, that was, he, he taught uh, Solomon Sassoon, Rabbi Dessler, during the war that. years, yeah. and they have, uh, so there's a lot to be said, and the, the, the Sassoon's very, very important uh, family, and uh, not just in, uh, the, the book that came out uh, this year about uh, Jews in, Shang, rich Jews in Shanghai, it focuses on the Kaduris and the Sassoon's, so uh, not all the Sassoon's turned out uh they didn't all follow in the path of Flora Sassoon and the Sassoons we're speaking about. Some of that family descendants, well, you probably know. I mean, it could be fine people, but from the, they've, they, they've left the Torah world. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. it's free choice. What can you do? Not everyone uh, chooses our path. Thank you so, so much. Uh, it was definitely, a, there's a series in that for sure, in the Sassoon family. And um, But uh, yeah, thank you everyone okay thank you very much bye everyone have a good night have a great day um, goodbye i'm looking at gustavo every class and i'm happy to see him <laughs> thank you very much